Hello friends, Jan Curcia welcoming you back to session four of our study of the Gospel of Luke and Book of Acts with an examination of chapter three of Luke concerning John the Baptist's role in the first advent of Christ and the genealogy of Jesus of Nazareth. And may I reiterate that it has been widely accepted that Luke's gospel and the book of Acts were letters written to a Roman procurator he referred to as the Honorable Theophilus with the aim of convincing him that Jesus of Nazareth is who he claimed to be and that his servant Paul was innocent of a charge of sedition that he be acquitted. Unlike Matthew, Mark, and John, Luke provides the time frame of the commencement of Jesus's three and a half year earthly ministry using the full list of political leaders of that time as markers, typical of Greek historical writing. It would be like me saying as a point of time that I began my first job during John F. Kennedy's presidency. In this frame are the marble busts of the Roman leaders mentioned by Luke in verses two and three, where it says, now in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, Herod being Tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip Tetrarch of Iturea, and the region of Taconitus, and Lysanias Tetrarch of Abilene, while Annas and Caiaphas were high priests, the word of God came to John, the son of Zacharias, in the wilderness. And since the Jews were forbidden to make images of any living thing in the second commandment, we have oddest renderings of ancient Jewish notables, as with these of Annas and Caiaphas in the bottom register by 19th century French artist James J. Tissot. And notice that Herod's nose has been broken off, most likely intentionally, often done in the ancient world as an insult to despise deceased rulers. Even today, statues of our founding fathers are being defaced and displaced. Not only did Luke refer to the Roman leadership in conformity with Greek historical literature to Theophilus, but I take it that he did so to show respect of Roman authority and his effort to counter claims that Christians, even Paul, threatened the peace and stability of the Roman Empire. That said, bear in mind that not only did Luke conform to Greek historical narrative style because he was a Greek, writing to a Greek, but that his writing would not be taken as Greek mythological storytelling. Luke wanted Theophilus to understand that Christianity was not just another religious cult, but the true faith in the true God of creation for both Jews and Gentiles to embrace. Beginning in verse 3, Luke wrote about John the Baptist, saying, And he went into all the region around the Jordan, as it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill brought low. The crooked places shall be made straight, and the rough ways smooth and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. Here John is quoting the messianic prophecy of Isaiah 40, 3-5. What John alluded to in preparing the way of the Lord is about royal servants going ahead of entourages to clear debris, level bumpy roadways, and fill potholes to ensure the king's comfort. And this frame is a Roman competum the vehicle of the wealthy traveling in this horse-drawn carriage was slow with a two-hour car ride taking about five days uh, to complete having no suspension to soften the stone pavers shown on the left in this frame traveling was uncomfortable however john used leveling the roadways metaphorically for preparing the hearts of the people for the coming of their messiah and his message of repentance and salvation. And beginning in verse 7, John exclaims to those who had come to get baptized, 
brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore bear fruit worthy of repentance, and do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. And even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Although we might think that John should have been happy that they came to repent and be baptized, he knows that they've come out of fear of judgment as opposed to being remorseful of their sin. And brood of vipers alludes to the offspring of their ancestors who had slaughtered God's prophets sent to warn them of the wrath to come. Jesus rebukes the Pharisees and scribes for being as murderous as their evil ancestors, on whom the blood of all righteous victims from Abel to the prophet Zechariah would be laid, Luke 11 and Matthew 23. Now, some who came to repent and be baptized that day asked John what they should do, to which he answered, He who has two tunics, let him give to him who has none. And he who has food, let him do likewise, verses 10 and 11. You might think that the benevolence to the poor the Baptist advocated would not have appealed to Theophilus, yet he would have been most impressed since charitable acts were highly valued in the Greco-Roman age. This is evident in Greek mythology where the wisest of all titans, Prometheus, was credited for stealing fire from the tyrannical gods, fire symbolizing knowledge and skill, and giving it to humans. Prometheus also gave mankind blind hope or optimism in order that they could use it constructively to improve the human condition. This mythological hero was believed to be the protector and benefactor of human beings, impressed with their potential to be self-governing, by which he is associated with freedom and democracy. And as we know, the Western ideology of democracy was birthed in Greek culture. And from the Greek ideal of philanthropy, evolved tax exemption of charities, particularly for hospitals, orphanages, and schools. And it was expected of the wealthy Greeks and Romans to be benefactors of these charities, as well as of the arts and Olympian sports, as we continue to do today. But we can say that long before Jesus advocated benevolence, the Greeks had practiced it although their motive to give appears to have been pride as opposed to compassion. The Jews practice benevolence, referred to as chesed, meaning loving kindness, and recognition and imitation of God's chesed to humanity. Yet the benevolence Jesus advocated was a radical form of it, expressed in chapter 6 of Luke, where giving is raised to a higher level and that we are to extend our hand to our enemies. Christian benevolence surpasses all, as Jesus declared that when we give to the poor, we are giving to their creator, as found in the parable of the sheep and goats, Matthew 25. So while impressing upon Theophilus that followers of Jesus of Nazareth were peacemakers, he would also learn that they were charitable, helpers of the helpless, as John the Baptist had preached. <clears throat> and Luke continued to write, beginning in verse 12, Then tax collectors also came to be baptized and said to him, Teacher, what shall we do? And he said to them, Collect no more than what is appointed for you. Likewise, the soldiers asked him, saying, and what shall we do? So he said to them, Do not intimidate anyone or accuse falsely, and be content with your wages. This would have impressed Theophilus as well, since Rome had strict laws against tax extortion, when even governors had been prosecuted for transgressing tax laws. Furthermore, Theophilus would have been impressed that even Roman soldiers had come to repent and be baptized by John. Again, Luke is portraying Christianity not only as a faith that teaches the moral and ethical way to live, 
but being the true faith for both Jews and Gentiles alike. Now, hearing people debating whether or not John was the Christ, in verse 15, John declared, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I is coming, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to loose. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. And this was fulfilled three and a half years later on Pentecost in the upper room, where 120 followers of Christ waited to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And it was the lowliest of slaves who removed their master's sandals to wash their feet. If you recall, Jesus demonstrated humble servitude at the Last Supper when he removed his disciples' sandals to wash their feet. John held no illusions of grandeur about his status in the kingdom of God, having a grip on who he was and who he was not, in line with God's plan and purpose for his life. John's preaching repentance for the decrease of sin was in fulfillment of what the Lord had told Isaiah. I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. Isaiah 43, 25. After his assignment was completed, preaching repentance for the remission or the decrease of sin in Judea, and to prepare the way for Christ's ministry, he told his disciples that Jesus must increase while he had to decrease. Now, John prophesied about the end times, saying in verse 17, his winnowing fan is in his hand and he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor and gather the wheat into his barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. And Luke concluded this passage saying, beginning in verse 18, and with many other exhortations, he preached to the people. But Herod the Tetrarch, being rebuked by him concerning Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, and for all the evils which Herod had done, also added this above all, that he shut John up in prison. I think that Theophilus would have been impressed with John's courage to rebuke Herod for his adulterous marriage as adultery was strictly forbidden in Roman law. Convicted adulterers were harshly punished with half of their property confiscated and or with banishment to penal colonies, unless, of course, the adulterers were kings. Then the one John and his disciples had been waiting for suddenly appeared to be baptized, saying, in verse 21, when all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also was baptized. Luke indicates that there was no special treatment of Jesus in his baptism, like everyone else that day waiting in line for John to immerse him, demonstrating that he truly was one with humanity. And then Luke wrote, and while he prayed, the heaven was opened. The first mention of the heavens opening up with visions and revelation is in the book of the prophet Ezekiel 1.1. And in verse 22, it says, And the Holy Spirit descended in bodily form like a dove upon him. Now, in bodily form indicates that the Holy Spirit was visible, at least to Jesus, if not to John and perhaps to others there that day. Although this is usually illustrated with a dove lighting on Jesus, it says that the Holy Spirit descended on him like a dove. The dove in ancient Jewish thought was a harbinger of a new world, taken from Genesis 8, when the dove sent out by Noah returned to him with an olive twig, indicating that the waters had receded and a new world had emerged. And Luke concludes with, and a voice came from heaven which said, You are my beloved son, in you I am well pleased. Wouldn't we love to hear God say that to us? Although the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are mentioned in Luke 135, Matthew 28, 19, John 132 and 34, 2 Corinthians 13, 14, Ephesians 4, 4 through 6, and 1 Peter 1 and 2, in Revelation 1, 4 through 6, it is at Christ's baptism that we have the evidence of the Trinity, 
with Jesus being baptized, the Holy Spirit filling him, and the Father speaking from heaven. Following Jesus' baptism, Luke interrupts the narrative in verse 23 with his genealogy. Luke's genealogy differs from Matthew's, who traced Jesus' descendants from Abraham to King David to Joseph of Nazareth, which would impress Jewish readers. However, according to the form of Greek genealogy, Luke begins with Jesus and traces his descendants back to as far as it could go to Adam, showing that Christ is a part of the entire human family, both Jews and Gentiles, which I think would have been of interest to Theophilus. And given that Luke included King David in Jesus' bloodline, I would think that his royal lineage would have further impressed Theophilus. And Luke begins the genealogy in verse 23, saying, Now Jesus himself began his ministry at about 30 years of age, being, as was supposed, the son of Joseph, the son of Heli, the son of Matat, the son of Levi, etc., etc. And that parenthetical clause, as was supposed, hints at Joseph not being Jesus' biological father, while the last verse in the genealogy reveals who his true father is, where it says in verse 38, the son of Enosh, the son of Seth, the son of Adam, the son of God. Now, Jesus was 30 years old when he started his ministry, which was in conformity with the minimum age for men entering public service or ministry. It would be at that age when most men would have been married for some time, had children, grew a livelihood, studied scriptures, and from which they would have been matured enough to serve. Well, this ends session four of Luke Acts, and I hope that you enjoyed it and that you will return for session five. And may you be blessed in every area of your lives as you study God's word.